would to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. Now you may be asking, where does one come to preach on Easter from Luke chapter 9? Let me give you a lyric or two from a song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Any of y'all know that song? Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Today our story ties together two events that are eight days apart. Eight days because there needs to be time for preparation and prayer. Eight days because at the end of preparation comes transformation. And at the midpoint of the ministry of our Lord, there is a foretaste of glory divine. For Peter and the disciples, it is a forecast of both who and what Jesus will do. But for Jesus, through the Father and the glory demonstrated on the mountain with Moses and Elijah and Jesus, it is the glorious divine purpose of God revealed. Turn with me this morning, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. We begin reading in verse 18 as we look at the disciples, and I hope you and I this morning receiving a dose of reality. We have to tread back to Matthew 16 and verse 13 to find exactly where this takes place. The scripture there tells us that Jesus and his disciples had come to a spot called Caesarea Philippi. Anyone ever been there? I've been there. Rudy's been there. It's up in the plush area where the grass is green and the slopes just kind of smooth out the countryside. There is a small mountain side, and the face of that mountain is cut off. And in the face of that mountain are niches, little windows, if you please. And in those windows are representatives of the gods that people believe that came forth from the belly of the earth as that stream comes forth from the bottom of that mountain. And there is a press there, an olive press. And Jesus and his disciples are there, and they're taking in the scenery. And as he looks up and he sees this niche after niche after niche of who people think that their gods are, he simply asks them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, if we read in the text, notice in verse 18, it says, Once when Jesus was praying, don't miss that word, once when Jesus was praying. When he was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? Now, folks, we've been looking in John's gospel, and we continue to journey there. I don't want you to think that we've left our Bible study, but we did take a short detour today in order that we might celebrate this great Resurrection Sunday called Easter. But last week, we looked at who is Jesus, who is he to his family, who is he to the crowds, who is he? to the religious leaders, and now in the text today, we're going to get a very clear picture about who he is and who he becomes to his disciples. So who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist. There were folks that thought that because of that horrible act of John being beheaded, that God miraculously had brought John back to life. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, that one of the prophets, or as other texts say, that 
prophet, meaning either Elijah or Moses. And having responded, then it becomes very personal, doesn't it? But what about you? I want to ask you on this Easter morning, as we consider a Savior worth worshiping, what about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? And of course, speaking not only for himself, but for the crowd, Peter answers, God's Messiah. In the Greek, he would have said, you are the Christ. You're the anointed of God. You are the one sent to save the world. And folks, I want you to know that's a Savior worthy of worship. And our first point this morning, I hope that you have found your outline. In this dose of reality, we first find that it is public. You know, the crowds have always had mixed understandings about the identities of people. In fact, if you uh, watch common shows upon television, quite often their notoriety is in direct relationship to the amount of applause they receive. If the guest wants them to be received well, he encourages great applause. And as millions and millions of viewers watch that show, they come to think that this must be a great person. Or maybe that viewer downplays the personality of the guest and there are no applause and so people think that by the millions we ought to be against this person. Have you ever noticed how more often than not that's exactly how every person who is on television representing Christ is treated? And so from the public side What do the crowds say? Well, they're fickle. We can't really look at that. But when you and I stand before God, the real issue is, what do you say when it comes to this person and your relationship with him? I want to tell you about a relationship with Christ. It is primary. It is not secondary. Jesus wanted to draw them into the conversation. He wanted them to listen to all the voices that are out there in the world. But my friend, I want you to know this morning, there's only one voice that matters. And that's the voice of God himself. When he calls you through his son by the power of the Holy Spirit to answer this one important question. Who do you say that Jesus is? is. My friend, you cannot get that from your parents. You cannot get that from your denomination. You cannot get that from television or any other source that comes from a personal relationship with Christ. When he speaks to the sinfulness of your life and mine and in our helpless and hopeless state, we cry out to him and he brings his saving knowledge into our life and thereby we become one of his children. We've recently studied over in a text in John's Gospel, chapter 4. You might want to turn there and familiarize yourself once again with the woman who came to the well at Samaria. Jesus really wanted her to understand who he was. She was a despised person. She was a rejected person She was a person who didn't even like herself. And my guess is today there are people here who have those same feelings. Some of you feel ostracized. Some of you feel rejected by those that you love or those who are your peers. And some of you don't even like yourself. You look at the sin and the mistake and the difficulty in life. And as a result of that, you're even disgusted with you. But as she listened, And Jesus Jesus brought her closer and closer and closer. Finally, we hear her uttering those words, I know, I know when Messiah comes, 
When the Savior comes, he'll tell us all things. There's hope there for me for the mess of my life to be straightened out. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Boy, she led out for that town with a bounce in her step and a smile on her face like no one had ever seen. And she announced as she walked down the streets with her head held up, come, see the man that told me whatever I did. Is this not the Christ? Oh, let me tell you about the first class conditional sentence. In the Greek text, it means, and he is. Now, folks, I want you to know they got up from where they were and they went to check it out. Now, if you look over in verse 42 of that same chapter in John, John 4, it says this, They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is, what? The Savior of the world. Oh, folks, this morning, a Savior worth worshiping begins with a personal relationship. I asked you this morning, do you know my Jesus? Do you know my Lord? Oh, friend, he died to save you and to save me. A dose of reality takes us to a personal relationship calling for responsibility. Roman numeral 2, a call to responsibility. In verse 21 and following, we find that this responsibility, first, is an imperative. Second, it comes because of its purposefulness for us to be saved instead of to be those who continue to lose. It produces a predicament in our life for when we are called to stand with Christ, we stand against the world. And in that predicament, there is always a pronouncement based on our choice. So read with me, if you will, as we go back to John, back to Luke 9, and we find first verse 23, an imperative. Jesus had strictly warned them not to tell anyone that he was the Christ or the Messiah. In this eight-day period, they came together together. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man, what? Must suffer. It's an imperative. It's something that you are commanded to do. It's something you must do. So we find in verse 23 that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, he must be raised to life. If we're going to follow the responsibility given us by our Savior, the imperative for us is we must first surrender. We must give ourselves wholly and completely to the will of the Father. And when we do that, it always calls for sacrifice, dying on a cross was a willing instrument of death assumed by our Lord. Now, we looked here just recently at the fact that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus was not at the cross because of the jealousy of the Jews. Jesus was not at the cross because of the concern of the Romans. Jesus was not held on the cross by the nails in his hands and in his feet. Jesus was there because out of love he chose to do the perfect will of the Father and to die for you and me. Don't forget, friend, this morning, he could have called 10,000 angels to spare him, but he died alone for you and for me. It's an imperative that he must follow the will of the Father. Thus he surrenders and sacrifices. And if you and I are going to do this, then it shapes us up into the likeness and the person of Christ. But there's a purpose. Notice verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus says, preceding this, must deny himself, 
take up his cross daily and follow me. And as the Lord surrendered, sacrificed, then we too, in doing that, are shaped up like him. But verse 24 says this, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. The operative word is the conjunction for. For if you want what Christ has to give, if you want what resurrection is all about, then you must, in order to save your life, give it up. I am reminded of the popular movie, Indiana Jones in the Search for the Holy Grail. How many of y'all saw that? Do you remember at the very end where the woman desires that cup so much that she loses Indiana's grip in order to try to grab the grail? That cup that would impart eternal life, that cup that seemed to be the only thing that really mattered in this world for she knew the temporariness of earthly quest. And in her reaching for the cup, she met her demise. She lost her life. But then the magic of the cup, the lure of Lucifer, reached up and grabbed the heart of Indiana. You remember that? And he reached and he says, I believe I can get it. I believe I can get it. And he keeps reaching and the more he reaches The less the grip of his father's hand, the less the grip of his father's hand. In his words, Indiana, let it go. Friend, there's some things in your life and in mine that we need to let go of. There are some things that need to be lost to us if we're ever going to reach up with both hands and find the security, the safety, and the salvation of the Father. And when Indiana let go of his desire and the thing that his heart was driving him toward, he found the security and the safety of the Father. Oh, friend, this morning I want to tell you that... It's very purposeful that we let go of everything we think is important in order to embrace that which alone is eternal. Maybe this morning you need to reach up and grab the hand with both hands of the Father. Well, there's a third point. There's a predicament. What good is it? God's always reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. And though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. There's always that reasoning of God. That call of God on our life. Trust me, try me, prove me, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out more blessing on you than you can stand. How many of you would like to have that kind of life this morning? I certainly desire that, but you've got to let grow of the grip of this world and the deceits of the evil one, and you've got to firmly embrace what God has given you. And the predicament is there. If you're going to gain and secure yourself, then you must forfeit and surrender yourself. Luke 12, 13 through 21 tells us of a man who was very successful in his farming enterprise for a particular year. He looked at all of his wealth. He looked at all that he had gained. He knew that he not only had sufficient supply, but he had enough for years to come. And he was concerned because he had so much, he didn't have enough places to put 
all his stuff. Hmm. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of those of you in here who have storage buildings. But my guess is your house, like my house, is full of way too much stuff. Why is it that we hold on to stuff? Why is it that we keep clamoring for stuff? Why do you and I want more and more stuff? What is it that stuff does for us? Well, we could turn the page to psychology. We could look at fears and insecurities. We could look at prestige and prominence. We could look at a lot of the things that make us want stuff. But we know that all of those are fleeting, fragile things. In our text, the farmer had a lot of stuff. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns, and I'm going to build me a bunch of storage compartments. (laughs) Now, he said storehouses. I know what he said, but what he meant, somewhere to store it so I can just sit back, rest, and take it easy. That's what he's wanting to do. And you remember those words operative in our Lord? He said, you fool. What did you forget? Your time is limited. Your space is short. Be a steward of what God has blessed you with. Did you not realize that this very night that your soul would be required of you? I want to ask you, would it change you if you knew that the minute you walked out that door this morning, you were going to drop dead? I want to ask you one more time, do you have a Savior worth worshiping? Do you know my Jesus? If you do, if you walk out this door and you drop dead, you've got glorious riches in heaven. It's stuff that moth and rust cannot corrupt, that thieves can't break in and steal from you. It's something that's real and lasting. Do you have a Savior worth worshiping? For that's who the resurrected Christ is. Or have you invested all in securing yourself only to find out, like the foolish farmer, you have surrendered yourself? Well, then there's a pronouncement in verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me, whoever is ashamed of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his glory. And in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Folks, he's talking about the end of time. He's talking about the day of judgment. He's talking about when the heavy weightedness of God that will wash away all of the ridiculousness of the world comes and we stand before him. Where are you going to be on that day? Well, will you be one of those who hear the pronouncement of denunciation? Will you be one of those who will beat upon your chest and say, I missed it? We had a great time this morning at the sunrise service. Best part about it is I didn't have to preach, which gave me an opportunity to do something that I seldom get to do, which is to go and sit through the service by my wife. But you know, I saw something from a different vantage point than I've been able to see in quite a few years. I saw these fishermen. Y'all do know the fish are biting. They're catching cobia, and they're catching uh, Spanish mackerel and king mackerel. uh, All of that off the ends of the pier. 
And here are all these fishermen. And we're having an Easter sunrise service. And here they go with their wagons by us. And, by, and I got to watching how those folks responded when they got to right where you were at, Barry, or where Brother Rudy was, or, or where, where Brother David was as they were speaking. And I, I began to be humored by the fact that this thing just will not stay on this morning. I'm sorry. Uh, but there it goes again. We might have to go to the... Well, if I do, they won't hear it. Let me try it one more time. There we go. Does that still look right? But I'm watching them go by one by one. You know, and, it, it, and I begin to be humored by their demeanor. You know, one guy, when we first got there, and he realized he was having a resurrection service and a and a, a, a one of these uh, religious things right there where he had chosen to go fisherman fishing this morning, he, he was a little ill at ease. And he, I said, Happy Easter. He said, Happy Easter to you. And I thought, you know this isn't where you're supposed to be. I didn't say that. I didn't need to. He knew it. But he overheard the conversation that Barry had left one extension cord short. Well, we're trying to round up an extension cord. And so I call Brother Bob. He's in the shower. He don't answer the phone. I'm glad you're clean, brother, by the way. I call Brother Rudy. He's too busy. He's got the message this morning. No, I can't help you. I'm, I'm really pleading the case for Brother Barry. We've got one amp over here that's not going to be working if we can't get it plugged in. And... About that time, you know that fellow that I, I, I'm telling you I talked to that he said, Happy Easter to you. Here he comes. He says, Do y'all need a, another extension cord? I said, Yes, sir. He says, I think I got one in the truck. <laughs> He's going to help us out. And about that time, the man that's running the place walks up with one, and I told him, Sir, I sure do appreciate it because it's really going to help us be able to do this service the way we desire to do it. And we get it all plugged up, and it's working. But I'm sitting down there watching these other fellows, and here comes this guy, and, and he's approaching. I, I, I need to give you some distance here. Okay, now you got to watch. You know, about where my stand is is where Brother Barry is, and he's walking, and you can tell he's, he's looking, and he's, he, gets, he gets about right here, and then he <laughs> struts, man. I mean, he struts right by. You know, I got to thinking about this last point here, this pronouncement, this denunciation. When we begin to strut in the things of this world, folks, we bow up our chest, we get stiff, we get erect, we get conceited, and we even walk and look that way. The very idea you bunch of Christians are out here the way of my fishing this morning. Well, you know, I think about the call to responsibility. It is an imperative that we should be like Christ because if we want to have our life, we've got to be willing to give it up. And the predicament is, is to secure that, we must forfeit. And the pronouncement, my friend, is going to come one day and we will stand accountable before Christ for how we choose. The Savior we worship. But the best part of the message is point three. There may be obstacles in our life. There may be difficulties that come because of the Christ way. But let me tell you. There's a glorious outcome. Jesus set his face like a flint, it says in the Greek, that he must go, in verse 53 of this chapter, to Jerusalem, 
to be betrayed, to suffer and die and be raised on the third day. And I want to tell you this this morning, that as you come on Easter Sunday morning, the Christian way is not an easy way. It is a way of suffering and sacrifice and cost. There will be obstacles and difficulties that will come your way. Oh, but friend, let me tell you, when you put the obstacle against the glorious outcome, it means absolutely nothing. Paul says, what is this in light of what all I will receive in glory? My friend, you've got to think a different way. You've got to act a different way. Yes, you even have to walk a different way. A glimpse of glory. The place, verse 28, he says he went up on a mountain. He went up on a mountain. And actually, it says a little more than that. He went up on a high mountain. There's nothing like getting on a high mountain to stir up a little bit of godliness, is there? When you begin to look out across the vastness of what you can see, when you begin to realize how big God is and how small you and the concerns of your life are, there's something about being on a mountain. And there's something in the life and the history of these men who believed that Jesus was the Christ that stirred up mountain images in their mind. Mountains like Mount Sinai or Horeb, if you call it that, where the law actually came and they're up on the mountain. And as they're on the mountain, there is this praying going on. In the midst of prayer comes transformation. And they look up and Jesus' face changes. And his garment changes. And the whole atmosphere changes. Friend, when you get a hold of the life of Christ, everything in life changes. And as that change came, Peter, John, and James are watching as he is caught up into the glory. The place is a mountain. The days are eight. Preparation has been made. Prayer has been offered up. And the glory comes. What do you think these two men were, three men were thinking about? They were thinking about their history as an Israeli and how God Worked his saving work at Mount Sinai through Moses. And those two men weren't just any two men. They were Moses and Elijah. They were the things necessary for the coming of the Christ in their prophecy. And in that eight-day period when all of this begins to be connected and they're on that high mountain, they don't want it to go away. Oh, friends, sometimes when God does a glorious work in our life, we don't want it to go away. But I want to tell you what, whatever we have here is what? But a foretaste. It is a foreshadowing of God's divine purpose. And on that mountain and on that day, God showed what he was going to do in and through his son, Jesus the Christ. For in that place, there was power. And with that power, there were unique people, Moses and Elijah. And with that, they had those disciples an opportunity to peer in to what the glory was going to be like. It says that they discussed. They got to talking. They had dialogue about his departure. Friend, they're talking about his death. Eighteen months if the chronology of Luke is correct, from this day on a Passover, just like this day, in a preparation made for, just like this day, Jesus would offer himself up as the spotless Lamb of God for the sin of the world. And Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about that. And as soon as they finished their encouragement, Peter, like you and I, we want to hold on to the holy. We want to try to box it up and keep it. We want to try to make it normative. 
Well, you know, if I went to a service and we sang a certain kind of music in a certain kind of way, then if we want God's glory, then that's what we've got to do, Brother Barry, every week. Oh, friend, I want you to know God's glory is not connected to anything that you and I contrive as a human. Now, I think we ought to come with excellence. I think we ought to come with the best that we are. And I want to say to all of you old folks, I think you ought to come with a teachable spirit. And I want to say to all of you young folks, I think you ought to come to learn something from the history of the past. And if we come like that, we will be the unified body of Christ, offering up our hearts to that audience of one, and we'll be worshiping our Savior. The very idea that we would do what they did, they held back in their peering. Having heard the conversation, having seen the glory, that covering that came over Jesus. Just as they started to hold on with that finite fear that you and I have that is going to depart from us. God speaks and declares his divine purpose. This is my son. Listen to him. Oh, friend, I want to tell you what's wrong in your life and in mine. We don't listen to the son. We listen to traditions. We listen to our desires. We listen to the allurements of this world. We listen to everything except the voice of the son. And I want to challenge you on this Easter to do something that The resurrection was all about. It was to declare to us without any, any arrow whatsoever that Jesus is the Christ. And in him and in him alone, there's life. Take these three things with you. Reality, the first point. Salvation. Is personal. If you have not put your personal faith and trust in Jesus. Friend there is nothing other than that. That will save you. That's the reality. The second thing we looked at is responsibility. Don't come to Christianity. If you're not willing to pay the price. For you see Christianity is sacrificial. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, hear, Paul, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God. This is spiritual worship. If you want to come in and leave this place and say, Pastor, I worshiped here today. Let me tell you what's got to happen. You've got to give your life as a living sacrifice to the Savior. Yes, that means whatever he wants, wherever he sins, Whatever he desires, you say, Lord, here am I, like Isaiah, send me. Send me. There is a word of reality. There is a word of responsibility. Oh, but folks, there is a word of glory. There is a word of glory at the end of that eight days. The overcoming of the temporal by the eternal removes the finite fear of the human. It is a glorious thing to know God's got it. If you could get anything as you leave this place on Easter Sunday morning, let me give you this one truth. God's got it. If you'll just trust him. He is indeed a Savior worth worshiping. Pray with me. Is our